أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين باري الخلائق يجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين حبيب الله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم ما صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful. It's due to that kindness and mercy that we have these opportunities where we gather to learn more about Him, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. We then send our condolences to our 12th and living Imam, Al Hujjah, Jalallahu Ta'ala, Farajahu Sharif, and to each and every one of you as we gather on these nights to commemorate the istishhad anniversary of Amir al Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhim afdalu salatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we all get an opportunity insha'Allah to go for the ziyarat of our Imam in Najaf and that we receive his shafaat in the hereafter insha'Allah. Before we continue with what we began yesterday, there was another unfortunate series of bomb blasts in Afghanistan that took place today. I'm sure we all heard the news. This is after multiple bomb blasts on Tuesday, which killed uh, at a school, killing young people. Um, and today, another some reports from between 12 and 30 were killed today. And so our prayers go out to them. Our hearts should ache terribly at what is happening there. We've always talked about these incidents that happen in Afghanistan. Um, it is an unforgiving place, it seems like, surrounded by unforgiving people. And um, our hearts ache, and I'm sure they, we feel a terrible pain. I can't help but think like how lucky we are. You know, I think one of the most important things that we can never forget thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for is the fact that we have safety and security. Yeah? This is one of the biggest gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives, you know. And uh, the fact that we don't have to worry about all of these things that our brothers and sisters, for example, in Afghanistan have to worry about. Um, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we should thank Him daily for that. But our hearts should also ache here, you know. And so we pray for our brothers and sisters there. We pray for their families. I just can't help but think again, you know, it's, it's broke my heart a bit today, you know. You know, I knew that there was going to come a time today if Allah had given us enough life that we would eat comfortably today, right? Without the stress of illness or death or, or bomb blasts. And I can't help to think about them, you know, that they have to fast and deal with all of these things that are happening. And so let's, let's pray for them, let's remember them with the Surah Al-Fatiha. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawm Al-Deen Iyaka Na'abudu Wa Iyaka Nasta'in Ahdina Sirat Al-Mustaqim Sirat Al-Lazina Na'amta Alayhim Ghayr Al-Maghtubi Alayhim الدين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد محمد وآل محمد sorry I don't think you guys heard me صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل trying to figure out different ways of saying that you know I thought I'd try this way this time inshallah we have yesterday we began a discussion regarding prophetic advice, advice that the Prophet counseled 
our first Imam alayhi salam and asked him to preserve these things. And what we said about these advice as we go through them for the rest of this month and probably after as well is that these things are very practical, very doable. Now as far as its implementation into our lives will really depend on where we are in the perspective of faith. How much do we engage in these things in the first place for us to be able to let go of them so that we can connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yesterday we talked about the first prophetic advice which was to always speak the truth and to never have a word of a lie come out of our mouth. And so we discussed that in detail. Today we come to the second advice where the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his family says, Wathaniya alwara'u wa la tajtari ala khiyanatin abada. Again, twice this abada comes. Yeah? He says, The second advice I give you is to practice wara'a. And we will talk about what is wara'a. Yeah? Wara'a comes from the root, from the word wara'a. That wa'u ra'ain. Wara'a. He says the second is to practice wara and never venture upon any type of khiyana ever. Yeah, khiyana is treachery, right? Betrayal. It's the opposite of amana. Yeah, if you are amin, then you are not a khain. But if you are not amin, if you are a person who is not trustworthy, then by default you are a person who betrays your trust and you practice khiyana. It is the same in Urdu, khiyanat. It is very similar meaning to the Arabic word. What is wara? The Prophet says practice wara. Wara is translated as piety. Yeah? Oftentimes bir is translated as piety. This is wara is also understood as being piety, but it's an action based of piety. You know, wara basically from a particular from the station of of spiritual progression, wara comes after taqwa. When you have taqwa and you have this relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the next thing you want to do is preserve that relationship. And the relationship is preserved through wara. Wara literally basically means to be extra vigilant, extra cautious, to avoid anything that will distance me from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what wara is. Yeah? And when a person does that, they are practicing piety, they are pious. So let me repeat that, right? Because this is important. That wara is to be extra mindful, extra vigilant. So it's more than normal, right? So you are cautious beyond the norm about not doing anything that will violate your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What that tells us is that we have already in some form or way developed a relationship with God. And so we realize how difficult it was to, number one, develop a relationship with God. Not because God is hidden, but because my own life was not maybe in line or in sync with God's wishes. But I was able to mold myself. I was able to let go of all the different vices that were distancing me from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so I was able to develop a relationship with God. Now that I have a relationship with God, piety or wara is to then ensure that I don't do anything that will once again break that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And so wara is an extremely important step in our journey towards God, but it's very action based. And so when the Prophet says practice wara, he's talking about practicing piety. Now, when you read the books of akhlaq, it's very interesting that there are levels of piety depending on the level of the person themselves. So depending on one's spiritual state, they could be practicing a different level of wara as opposed to somebody else who may not have that same state of piety. We talked about this yesterday, that when we, for example, do istighfar, the reasons we may be doing istighfar are different than why the Prophet did istighfar. Of course they're different. He didn't commit sins like I commit sins. He didn't make mistakes like I make mistakes. But we find that he continuously engaged in istighfar. The reason was that his connection to God and his reason for doing it was different because of his spiritual state. right? And so the more we progress towards God, the more our... Our challenges differ, the more our abilities differ. You know, even the fact that 
Like sometimes when we think about like tests, right? Like for example, like our tests are not like the tests of the people of Afghanistan, are they? No, they're not, man. I don't have to worry about somebody planting a bomb here, somebody doing that. And Allah protect us, inshallah, because you never know. But at the same time, I don't have to have those same type of fears. I don't have to worry where I'll get my meal. I don't have to worry if Taliban's going to come knock on my door. I don't have to worry about all of these things, right? And so my tests are different. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't like me, right? Because, you know, like sometimes we hear these traditions that say that a believer whom God loves will constantly be in one form of bala after another form of bala. Now when you read that or when I read that, it will be like, subhanAllah, does that mean God doesn't love me? Because my balas are not like that. My balas could be small. My trials could be much smaller from perspective. Yes, they are there to hold on to my faith, no doubt. Holding on to our faith when in times of ease and luxury may be considered to be more difficult. But I think that depending on our outlook of faith, depending on our uh, spiritual state, simply recognizing that my tests are not reserved for negative aspects alone, but rather my journey or daily journey to break through the, the shackles that are distancing me from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is my test. You understand? Yeah, I hope you understand, right? I know it's very difficult, yeah? But stay with me, okay? That the tests differ depending on rank. So like if I have a higher spiritual state and it comes from, from effort, right? Like we're not just, we don't just trip on a higher spiritual state. We don't just slip on it or fall on it. No, you earn it, right? But as we earn it, what we realize is that daily, there are distractions which are distancing me from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these distractions in many instances are halal. Yeah? They are allowed. Allah wants them to enjoy us. But in my enjoyment of those things, I continue to be distant from God. And so as a believer of that type of rank, that becomes my daily test that God showers upon me. Just the recognition of that. It's a huge um, relief or a huge awareness of what my tests are. You guys follow or no, right? To come back to this wara, similarly, there are different layers of where a person's wara or piety may be. The most common or the most basic level, this is the level of the awam. This is us, basically, right? Is that wara means to abstain from all types of sin. That's piety. Yeah? And we'll focus on this right? in more detail because this is where we are. right? That our wara, our piety, for us to be considered pious, our first and primary level is to avoid sin. That's it. Yeah? Things that we should be doing, but we all know how difficult it is to do. Hence, for us, the awam, we will be considered pious by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we can simply avoid sin. Subhanallah, that's powerful, yeah? That's powerful if you think about it. Now, this is the awam. Then there is the khawas, yeah? There is the elite, right? For the people who are elite, their wara, their piety consists of refraining or avoiding anything which is doubtful. Because anything which is doubtful has a greater chance of making me distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they avoid any place any situation where there is a possibility that something may happen which will distance me from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a higher level altogether, right? We will, we will agree with that. There is halal and haram and between that there is a tremendous amount of space. But those who have this higher level of piety or, or understanding of God, they will avoid even those things which may hint of coming close to doing something haram. They will avoid that and that's the next step. And so again, if for example you are able to look at your life and say honestly that okay, alhamdulillah, I don't sin on purpose. And you know what? It shouldn't take a lot for us to say that. Yeah? We have alhamdulillah been living this faith for so long, proclaiming the oneness of God for so long that 
I've always felt this. It's mind-boggling to me when people still sin on purpose. Mind-boggling to me. Like, how can you get into the car and listen to music? How? Right? How can you turn on the TV and watch something inappropriate? How? Are you in no fear of God at all? At all? Yeah? What kind of faith do we have? Right? Like I get these questions all the time from like youngsters especially, but it's not just reserved for youngsters. And I remind them that, look man, you are walking a very dangerous path that you know this is haram and you still engage in it. Dangerous path. Because if you die at that time, God forbid, we never know, but God forbid you die at that time knowing that Allah is there and I am still doing it, you die in kufr. Yeah? That means you don't consider God valuable at all. Like we should be mindful of these type of things, right? Um, and so the second level is, we said, to avoid things which are doubtful, right? The third level, and this is even a higher level, this is the wara of the ascetics, the zahidun, uh, the, uh, the people who practice zuhud. For them, it's their wara is to even avoid those things which are lawful, which are allowed because they know that they will one day be questioned about that which they did. Now that's another level altogether, right? And we're not asking us to hit that yet, right? But that second level of wara is where we should be, right? Where if we know a place is doubtful, a thing is doubtful, doesn't smell right, doesn't, doesn't feel right, then don't do it, right? Don't do it. Like I get questions all the time, like, Sheikh, is this music allowed? And I was like, man, why are you asking me to listen to it? Right? Like, I don't listen to it. Like, if, you, if you're even asking that question, don't listen to it. Right? Don't listen to it. Very simple, right? Like, it's the same thing we said about, about like, the practice of silence and speaking. We said, if you even have to ask yourself that, hey, is this going to be offensive? Then don't ask, don't say it. Right? Because if you even have to ask yourself that question, it's probably in that gray area, so don't say it, don't do it, right? And similarly, when it comes to our lifestyle. So we can talk about all of these other things, but for us, when the Prophet says, Athaniya al wara that the second advice I give you, O Ali, is to practice wara, this wara for us is to avoid sin, right? Is to avoid all sin. And this is where in this month we get our training. If you recall, we mentioned this in the Masaib yesterday, but this is Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Ma salli ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. He asks the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his family. He says, Ya Rasulullah, ma afdalul a'mal fi hadha shahar. What is the best action one can do in the month of Ramadan? And the Prophet replied, Ya Abu al Hassan. أَفْضَلُ amal fi هَذَا shahar al Same word al an maharim Yeah, That the best action you can do in this month Is to not sin And do anything haram in this month Is to avoid all types of sin Imagine, you don't have to read Quran You don't have to do anything Avoid sinning and you'll be doing the best action Right? And so in this month we get this tremendous like motivation or not even motivation practice practice not to sin in this month right like a lot of us will have that level of shame that in the month of ramadan we will not sin and i and i commend that i don't find that hypocritical though it is very hypocritical yeah but i don't find that hypocritical because at least you're not sinning like i'm not gonna like toss the non-sinning at the window because there's a bit of hypocrisy, right? Alhamdulillah, you didn't sin in the month of Ramadan. Inshallah, it will continue in the month of Shawwal. Inshallah, right? And that's the aim, that's the hope that whatever we do in this month continues. What we have to understand about sinning and why sinning has been told to us to, uh, to avoid at all costs is that sinning rusts the heart, yeah? Um, you should go and listen to the series of lectures we did on the heart and why it's so important. Sinning rusts the heart. Now, we don't necessarily see that rust because it may have been a one-time sin. But that one-time sin already made the heart experience that sin. It made the heart taste that sin. And so that, that flavor of sin remains in the heart forever. Forever. You can't avoid that anymore. This is why like when... If I could... 
like guide some young people, my, my first and foremost advice would be to never sin. Never sin. Yeah? Is it possible? Man, it's possible. Of course it's possible. Is it difficult? Of course it's difficult. Right? But you don't have to sin. Look, there are certain things that we just can't avoid. Yeah? We just can't avoid. Now, we can't avoid there being music when I go to the grocery store. I can't avoid that. I can't be like, hey, shut off the music. Yeah? We do that at restaurants sometimes. Baba, can you shut this up? We can't go to a grocery store. You can't sit on the TTC and then the music stop. No, these things are unavoidable, right? And so you have to live your life around that. But you don't purposely then add on more distractions into your own life by doing it yourself willfully, right? Um, what we understand is that sins put a layer of rust on the heart. And that in itself is a problem because it begins to turn our attention away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the secondary thing which I think is really important for us to understand about sinning, right? Is that sinning prevents the good actions that we do from reaching its intended effects. Pay attention to this. This is important. This is what our ulama of akhlaq tell us. That sins prevent my good actions from reaching its intended effects. Everything good that we do should have a positive effect in our lives. No doubt. Yeah? Prayer. Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar. Asiyam la'allakum tattakun. Right? That prayer should prevent you from indecencies and wrong. How is it possible then that I can pray my Jamaat Salah and then go and backbite while having dinner? How is it possible? It should prevent me from Fahshai wal Munkar. It should. This is what God says. Right? How, why is it not happening? Allah says fast. Why? Because it will produce Taqwa. Right? Why is it then that I fast and I'm not, I don't have that much Taqwa? is because number one, either I myself am committing sin and so my actions are not resulting in the effects that they should or even though I may not be committing sin, I live in an environment where it automatically dampens my light of the heart. And you don't have to be a sinner for our hearts to be dampened by this world, yeah? for our hearts to become engulfed or rusted. The world in itself does that, right? The fact that we hear, for example, incident after incident after incident around the world that is heartbreaking, after a while we're not affected by it anymore. It doesn't mean we're bad people, we're just not affected by it. Likewise, when you see things which are inappropriate all the time, you hear things and these are all accidental. We're not even talking about on purpose. Accidental. We can't control how people dress when we go to work, how people dress when we go to school, how people dress when we travel. We can't control any of those things, right? And so we're told then don't add more of that stress into your lives. We can't control all of these things that are happening. But these things, even though I am not actively participating in them, rusts my heart. It does. Right? And so how do I counter that? How do I counter that? I counter that by not sinning. It's simple. It's very simple. Sinning rusts the heart. Being in an environment that is sinful rusts my heart. The way I combat that is by actively avoiding sin. You know when Allah says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا zina." Right? Do not come close to inappropriate relations. Right? He doesn't say don't do it. Don't even come close to it. That means like I don't have any closeness to it. That's how we should be with sin. Keep in mind, there are going to be certain times when I just can't avoid whatever happens. But me as a person, man, you will see me actively avoiding sin. Right? And I'm not saying me, but I'm saying we. That a believer is one who actively avoids sin. They plan it out. Yeah? They think it out. Like basic things, right? Like, okay, um, I know this place will have people dressed inappropriately because it's summertime, it's hot. And I'm not gonna, you're not going to find a believer in that place. Yeah? You're not. 
And yes, well, that, does that mean that I have to maybe miss out on fun things? Yeah, that's life. Honest to God, that's life. Because the fun things I'm looking out for are in Jannah, not in dunya. Yeah? And if this fun thing here is going to dampen my fun in Akhirah, why would that ever be worth it? Right? Why would that ever be worth it? Our sixth Imam as Sadiq alayhi afdalu salatu was salam. Salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. He says, look at this tradition. Yeah? He says, Laysa minna. That the person is not for considered from amongst us. This is heavy, right? Laysa minna. Man kana fi misrin fihi mi'atu alfin o yazidun. That if this man or a person lives in a city where there are a hundred thousand people or more, وَكَانَ فِي ذَلِكَ الْمِسْرُ أَحَدٌ أَوْ مِنْهُ And if there is a person in that city of a hundred thousand or more who has more wara than that person, then he is not from our Shia, he says. Subhanallah. Right? Subhanallah. Like this wara is that. Now again, we think that subhanallah, I'm supposed to be one out of a hundred thousand. Yeah? I'm supposed to be one out of a million. I'm supposed to be one out of that. How do I even get there? Simple. Don't sin. That's it. That's all it takes not to sin. Because if I don't sin, God looks at that and says, that is a, that is a servant of mine who is pious. Yeah? You know, we often hear piety as being so difficult, so big, so, oh, I got to wear a topi now. No, you don't have to wear a topi. Yeah? You don't have to hold a tasbih. You don't have to do this. Just don't sin. Right? Just don't sin. And this is something, like I said, we have to work on in this life of ours. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Just very quickly, if you go back to that tradition, the original advice, the Prophet says, Wa thaniyatu al wara. That it, the second advice I give you is to practice wara, and we talked about exactly what it means. And then he says, "Wala tajtari ala khianatin abada," and do not ever venture upon khiana, treachery. Now, again, this is interesting because when he says "don't sin," khiana is a sin, isn't it? Right. So how does that? Why does he mention khiana separately? Khiana, we said, is treachery, it's betrayal. We don't fulfill the trusts that have been given upon us. The ulama tell us two things. They say one, that treachery is probably mentioned here specifically because it is one of the worst forms of sins one can commit. Yeah? To betray someone's trust, whether it is the trust of God. God has given us so many things. When I use my eyes for the purposes that God has not intended them, I am considered to be a khain. I have betrayed the trust of God. God says in the Quran that I took an ahad from everyone, a promise from all of you. Alastu bi rabbikum. We said bala. He said, Am I not your Lord? I said bala. Now in this world, if I sin, I am committing treachery. Right? I am betraying that trust of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So from that perspective, it is considered to be one of the worst forms of sins that a person can commit. Another understanding is that this has. This, this khiyana has a wider meaning than a sin. And what it refers to in the context of wara in particular is that anything that one does that counters their connection to God, even if that thing be halal, if it hinders my relationship with God, or my obligations that have been set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that particular action is considered a form of khiyana. You understand? Yeah? Let me repeat this again. That any action that one does, in particular we are referring to those actions which are considered to be lawful, halal. But in my doing of that action, my fulfilling that action, if it causes me to not fulfill my duties to God, then that action, though it is halal, is a form of khiyanat that I have committed, a betrayal. So for example, let's say I'm watching TV at night, right? And 
I stay up too long, too late. Or in Mahi Ramadan, I go out with my friends and have suhoor, right? I come back late, I go to sleep, I don't wake up for fajr, right? I have done khiyana, yeah? And that action of me hanging out with my brothers, which is halal, recommended, beautiful, is a form of khiyana for me if I do that thing again. Subhanallah. Yeah? That is the higher level of khiyana we're talking about here. Like we said, there are layers to this. You know, when we, when we say that the Qur'an has layers, the meanings of these piety and taqwa have layers. It depends on what level we're at. But this is what is meant here. So we have to be very careful. Okay? That it's not just the haram we have to avoid. But in the committing ourselves to halal, if in that halal... That halal distances me from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that thing problematic for me. And I should avoid it at all costs. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. We'll continue with other advice inshallah, but again as a, as a homework assignment. Yesterday our homework assignment was very simple. Try not to lie one day, right? Today our homework assignment is very simple, don't sin. I'm not asking you to not sin forever. What I'm asking you is just not sin tomorrow. Yeah? And then the day after, don't sin that day. Never look at it as forever, because it's too hard to think about it as forever. But just don't sin one day at a time, and each day will be a day of Eid for us, inshaAllah. We continue with our remembrance of the musibah that befell Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. You know, when Imam alayhi salam was struck and when Hassan and Hussein came by the side of Imam Ali, Imam Ali alayhi salam says, My sons, do not cry. For by God, I see Rasulullah standing in front of me. I see your grandmother Khadija standing in front of me. I see your mother Fatima Zahra calling me. And then we are told Ibn Muljim was brought in front of the Imam. The Imam looks at Hassan and says, Ya Bunayya, nahnu ahlu baytin. La yazdadu ala dhanbi ilayna illa karaman wa afwa. He says, we the Ahlul Bayt do not resort to evil with its like. He says, my son, if I am to live, then I will deal with him myself. And I will forgive him. But if I am to die, then only strike him one time. Because that is how he struck me. And then we are told the Imam alayhi salam was carried by his children towards the house. This is where my heart again asks me, hum, that when Imam alayhi salam saw Zainab standing by that door, I wonder what the Imam thought at that time, that Zainab has still so much more to see, that she does not need to bear this burden of seeing her father in this way. Zainab has a lot of tears, she still has to cry. She does not need to cry for her father right now. It is said that the poison on the 20th night had spread through the body of Amir al Mu'mineen. The Imam alayhi salam spent that entire day and night guiding the guiding his family advising his family he says fear allah in the matters of the orphans do not let them starve do not let them do not leave them without looking after them and then the imam alayhi salam told the people of Kufa to come and see him one final time. This is when his companions began to come. The Imam alayhi salam says, Hujr ibn Adi. He says, Ya Hij, will you ever leave my wilaya? Hujr replies, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, even if they were to cut my body into pieces, I would never leave your wilaya. I wonder if Imam looked at him and says, Ya Hij, that is exactly what will happen to you. And then the Imam alayhi salam asked his companions to leave. 
But they could hear one companion crying, not able to leave. Imam al Hassan comes. He sees the companion of Ali Asbagh bin Nabata. He says, Ya Asbagh, Mawla has asked you to leave. He says, By God, I know what my Mawla has asked, but my heart will not allow me to leave this place. Imam says, come to me, Asbagh. Asbagh comes to the Imam crying. He sees the poison and the bleeding on the Imam's head. The Imam says, Ya Asbagh, do not cry. By God, this is Jannah, I see. Asbagh says, Ya Imam, I know you are going towards Jannah, but I cannot bear living without you, O oh my Imam. We have indeed become orphan <laughs> ya hussein 